Welcome to Marrow Masters Season 12, brought to you by the National Bone Marrow Transplant Link and sponsored by Sanofi. The NBMT Link, established in 1992, strives to help patients, caregivers, and families cope with the psychosocial challenges of bone marrow and stem cell transplant, from diagnosis through survivorship. Season 12 of our show focuses on the important question of, I'm home, now what? Here's your host, Executive Director of the NBMT Link, Peggy Burkhart. Welcome, everyone. Today, we have Gregory Proctor with us, a multiple myeloma patient who has fought a relentless battle against this devastating disease for two and a half years now. Despite the numerous challenges and hardships faced, Gregory has finally regained his strength and is transitioning back into normal life. Greg, 53 years old from San Antonio, Texas, is going to share his journey with us today. I promise you, you will be wowed and inspired by this incredible man. Hello, Gregory. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you, Peggy, for having me. I'm pretty excited about talking to you about my story. Terrific. Well, let's get started. Share with us your experience of undergoing a stem cell transplant, how everything has gone, and how it's changed your perspective on life. Well, I was diagnosed July 19th of 2022 with multiple myeloma. And that day was, as most people say, when you first hear the words cancer, probably one of the worst days of your life. Mm -hmm. And I think for me, it wasn't necessarily hearing the words cancer. It was more along the lines of what my oncologist said to me and my wife at the time, please get your affairs in order. Now, let's keep in mind, this was on a Friday. Mm -hmm. And... We were towards the afternoon set of her appointments and hearing those words, get your affairs in order and having to go through the entire weekend trying to cope and reconcile with what is multiple myeloma? What does she mean by get your affairs in order? Am I going to die? Wow. So it was tough. It was very, very, very hard. Currently, I'm in remission after completing a stem cell transplant on February 9th of 2022 and doing quite well. Uh, But it was a a very difficult journey, which we will talk about more later. Yes, we are going to dig in. It makes me giggle a little bit. Maybe the first rule is don't have those appointments on a Friday. (laughs) (laughs) Right? Yeah. Oh, goodness. Well, I think I didn't have a choice, uh, which we'll talk about a little bit later, because within the time that I met my oncologist, on Wednesday, and then going through a bone marrow biopsy, all of the scans and blood work, extensive blood work, you know, it was 48 hours from meeting her to the time that I actually realized officially that now you have multiple myeloma. Oh, wow, Gregory. So let's talk about some of the top challenges. You know, the season is about, I am home now, (laughs) why? And I am Just so happy that we are doing this and we're giving folks the chance to understand what it is like when you get home and how do you deal with it all. So I'm going to let you jump right in. Okay. Well, I think the first time after you get home, you're physically weak and you're somewhat lethargic and kind of feeling like, where did your energy go? And I'm going to add a little bit of a twist to what you just asked me, because in my circumstance, my personal experience was I spent 11 days in the hospital going through the transplant procedure. Uh Uh-huh. My wife and I were all excited about coming home on that, you know, 11th day and realizing that, ah, the sigh of relief, we're home now. Mm. And so as we were sitting down at our kitchen bar, eating a bite to eat, my wife was very diligent and very focused on checking my temperature, watching for all the things that the nurses had kind of advised her of. So as she gets the thermometer and places it towards my head, she looks at me, she says, are you feeling okay? And I said, yes, I'm feeling fine. And she did it again. And I said, well, what's wrong? She goes, I cannot get a temperature reading. Really? Let me go get the baby thermometer and put it underneath your armpit. Wow. So she goes and gets the baby thermometer and puts it underneath my armpit and realizes that my temperature is so high 
that is not even measurable on any one of the thermometers. No. And immediately, 14 hours after being released from the hospital, I was back mm. in the hospital again and going through this vicious cycle of trying to figure out what is going on. So to answer your question, I'm home now. For me, it felt like it was a cheese. Yeah, sure. <laughs> home for a minute. Yeah, for a split minute. And so by the time I went through the next eight days of all the vicious cycles of tests, you know, looking at bacterial, viral, what type of infections could it possibly be? On the eighth consecutive day, they basically said, we're going to chalk this up as engraftment syndrome. Mm. And at this point in time, we are saying to ourselves, OK, we have to maintain the fever. Fever has to be under control and we're ready to go home. So by the time we got home on the second stint, our fingers were crossed uh -huh. because I was extremely, again, weak and frail, mm -hmm. not a lot of energy, and just trying to reconcile in my mind, you know, not touching things, not doing things I'm not supposed to do because it's like a boy in the bubble perspective mm -hmm. from a standpoint of getting home and trying to just make sure you do diligently what you have to do just to continue with your life as you're recovering. Wow. Uh, what about the immune suppression? What did you go through with that? Well, in the case for me, my immunosuppression, which we were always very concerned with, was certainly just trying to understand how the chemo and all of the other variations of things were impacting me. And in my case, my immunosuppression left me, like I said, feeling very, very weak. And my wife was extremely concerned with that because she was like, you know, if your white blood cells or WBC and platelets are low, we want to make sure that you're not touching things. We want to make sure you're not doing things you're not supposed to do. Even as it related to, for lack of better terms for your listeners, going to the bathroom, you, we want to take extra, extra precautions. And so we kind of went to the extreme, you know, from a dietary standpoint, from what I touched in our home, to literally everything about my life, trying to keep me in this bubble to ensure that I didn't contract or pick up anything because we knew how vulnerable I was being immunocompromised and immunosuppressant. Absolutely. Gregory, let's talk about the emotional roller coaster, just mentally and just trying to manage it all. Well, from the onset of being diagnosed, um, it's hard. It really is hard. I think the thing that is most difficult in the journey of dealing with the emotions and anxiety and concerns of uncertainty is trying to figure out how do you cope with these things in a way that it provides you with peace of mind. Mm -hmm. And for me, my life, which was very exciting and somewhat on a trajectory of doing some things great in the world, to have this happen to me was the punch in the gut that I was unexpected and trying to fathom, you know, getting myself out of a depressive state for a couple of weeks and realizing that I needed to figure out how to accept what my new life and my new journey was going to be. And so that emotional anxiety and like I said, uncertainty earlier was very difficult because here it is, you're taking a guy that's extremely energetic, extremely passionate about what he does. And now you've just you know, hit him in the gut with the cancer and trying to figure out if I can't tie my shoes, if I can't put my own clothes on, if I can't, you know, that is psychological warfare. It's like having, you know, I think what they say, uh, PTSD and understanding that why, you know, the mind wants to do it, but your body doesn't allow for you to be able to do some of the simplest functions in life. And that really places a sense of burden, not only on one's ability, but it also, even though one doesn't want to believe that it places a burden on your loved ones and your caregivers and your family, it does because now they don't view you the same way. And so all of these things coming into play uh, for me was like, like a tsunami, like a storm that was unexpected. Oh, of course. And what about the fear of recurrence? Did you, do you struggle with that at all? Well, Peggy, it's a 24-7 job mm. in dealing with this disease. And you can 
emotionally, psychologically, and physically put yourself in a position to where you're always concern and worry and just feeling like, you know, you just can't get over this battle. One of the things that I had to realize very early on was that cancer is a chapter in my life. Mm -hmm. It is something that I have to go through. It is a process that I'm having to deal with. It defined me for the moment that I'm in it, but it doesn't define my future. And so the segregation that I had to find peace within myself on was realizing that I needed to focus on cancer as cancer was needed, particularly as related to treatment, uh, appointments and things like that. But outside of dealing with those, you know, attributes as related to me getting healthy, I had to stay focused on life. Mm -hmm. And if I'm being given a second opportunity for life, What am I going to do with that? Because I'm still above ground. I'm still flourishing. I'm still thriving. My mind is still working. My physical extremities may not be where they need to be, but they're getting back there. And so for me, it was very important to have a delineation or a separation between, yes, this is cancer, but I also have a life that I must live. Oh, good for you, Gregory. This is exactly what we want to cover. And I so appreciate your candor. I know you are, oh my goodness, this gentleman has won major awards. <laughs> His time is, he. I think you have a new career just helping all the cancer groups. He's writing a <laughs> book. So we are talking to a real incredible soul here who is sharing really just very honestly how difficult this has been. And I just know this is going to resonate with a lot of people. Gregory, let's touch on the financial implications. Uh, This is a tough subject. We know that having cancer, it's toxic on many levels, but also financially. Would you mind sharing with us your feelings on that? Well, the toxicity of being diagnosed, which is not, in my mind, discussed enough in the world today. The stats that are out there are very staggering as relates to someone being diagnosed with cancer and how it leaves them in a financial duress or financial stress. For my wife and I, we recognized early on that this was going to be expensive. Mm -hmm. We had some preconceived notions that, okay, our insurance is a fairly good insurance policy. It should help us weather the storm. Of course, we're going to have out-of-pocket costs and other things that certainly we would have to deal with, which we felt at the time that it would be possible to kind of cope and weather the storm. But what we didn't know is our insurance company coming back after three months and basically saying, Mr. and Mrs. Proctor, you've hit your ceiling. Mm. What we did know is that at certain points where our doctor was farming out MRIs and blood work and other various extremities that we needed to have to kind of monitor my case and ensure that the treatment was working, was that these things should have been done in a network where we wouldn't have $1,500, $2,200, $3,200 coming out of our pocket. And so by the time that third month rolled around for us, we were a quarter of a million dollars Mm. upside down with my oncologist, burning $22,500 per week, which is literally unheard of. It's like buying a brand new vehicle every single week. And when we started to kind of dive in and pour in our expertise, just being diligent about our survival, my survival, we finally realized that we had to contact the insurance company and really have a in-depth discussion about what is covered, what is not covered, getting a copy of the contract, and really digressing the information that is in those documents to ensure that we are making the right educated decisions and helping our doctors make the right educated decisions as we go forward. The toxicity left us in a, in very much a, uh, a hole mm-hmm. because over a quick, quick period of time, we found that this number was beginning to trend towards the hundreds and hundreds of thousands. And before we knew it, we were peaking a million dollars. And on record today, not that all of this money came out of my pocket, 
But what we've tracked is about $2.65 million at what it's cost me over the past two and a half years to get myself healthy again. And when you're on a 70-30 or an 80-20 or 60-40 split between yourself and your insurance company, think about the amount of dollars that you're having to come up with in order to keep yourself alive. The importance here, and one of the things that I'd like to just emphasize just briefly, is not only is it important to grab hold of the situation at the time of the inception of being diagnosed, but it is equally important to find and seek those additional resources, grants, local, state, federal programs that can help you weather the storm because if you're thinking your insurance company is going to carry the full financial burden as it relates to being diagnosed with cancer and the toxicity that goes along with it, I would hate to say this, but certainly that is not the case. Oh, wow. Very interesting and very honest. Thank you for that, Greg. <laughs> Let's move on to, I want to touch on some, some of the social isolation uh, when you got home. And I know you're an extrovert. I know this about you. So, and I am too. <laughs> so how did you handle that? Well, you know, I was diagnosed right in the height and peak of the pandemic. So we were kind of already living in this isolation and being diagnosed in the heightened period of, of the pandemic certainly kind of prepared me for what I was going to have to deal with, with the aspect of dealing with cancer. But what I was unaware of at the time, of course, we became aware very quickly, was the even more constraining and restrictive aspects of that social interaction and social contact by having this disease, especially coming out of the stem cell transplant. Because again, being immune compromised or immunosuppressant and having to ensure that everything you do, you're kind of protecting yourself. You're ensuring that you don't invite people into your environment that could cause you harm or eating things that could cause you harm. So all of these things just became like a question and answer circumstance with every aspect of my life during that particular period. It was a who, what, where, when, and how. Really understanding, you know, the trajectory of, you know, where did the food come from? Mm -hmm. well, who are these people? Who have they been around? Where have they been? Because... You know, I had to ensure that not only was I protected, but they were also protecting um, uh, me as well because I didn't want to pick up anything in any type of interaction with dealing with folks. And so the social isolation for me, like I said, COVID helped me prepare, but in the aspect of dealing with it even much longer than I would have projected just made it even more complicated for me because we would go to the grocery stores low peak hours. Mm -hmm. We would uh, hit the trails when there's nobody else on the trails. I felt like I was living my life in complete opposite of the rest of the world for that period of time. Sure, sure. Oh, wow. All right, Gregory, let's talk about regaining your strength and mobility in life today. Tell us what it's like and more about your journey. Sure. In the beginning, coming home from the hospital, my muscles felt as if they had no strength, as if I had no capacity to move my own body weight. And so for the first month for me, I was bed, couch, bed, couch. Okay. And unfortunately, I only walked like about 15 miles within a 30-day period, according to my Fitbit. <laughs> and my wife and I looked at each other and said, well, if you're feeling this weak and you're not starting to regain your strength after this period of time, we may have to get you back to the doctor and see what else is going on because you've just really gone through something, you know, very strenuous to your body. And so I told my wife, I said, okay, let's see what happens as we begin to get into the second month. So around day 33 to 35, I asked her, I said, let's go out for a walk. I may not be able to walk very far, but let's just go out for a walk, mm -hmm. maybe go to the end of the block, walk to the stop sign, walk to the mailbox, whatever, just so that I could start to kind of rebuild some strength and capacity. And so rebuilding that strength and capacity to get myself back to where I am today, it was a mental, stressful 
you know, almost torture type uh, effort for me because I wanted more than what my body could actually provide me at the time. And so I had to figure out how to be more patient than what I already was because it was like, Greg, if you did a thousand steps today, then okay, it's fine. You know, don't uh, beat yourself up too bad because your body's healing. And eventually I got to a point to where it was a thousand, it was 1100, it was 1200, it was getting back up to 2000, so forth and so on. But every inch that I took step by step allowed for me to kind of build upon that foundation. And eventually we got back to where we were, I think we peaked out at about 200 miles of walking per month, huh. which was wow, approximately four, maybe five months, maybe six months after my stem cell transplant or we're back into that routine again. And so psychologically, like I said, it was very hard. It was very tough. You know, I had to really push my boundaries mentally and physically, but I knew it was important to basically be able to get out and try to do a little bit every single day to ensure that my body would begin to heal and recover and have the stamina that would be needed to have a prosperous life. Oh, that's great stuff. It's so true, too. Sometimes it's just baby steps, a mm -hmm. little bit every day, and look at where you are now. Mm -hmm. All right, Gregory, what about medication management? Will you speak to what that's like for you today? <laughs> well, I took a little bit of an unorthodox approach with, with my medication management. Okay. After my stem cell transplant, where I was on a regiment of five days a week, six to eight hours per day of chemo and immunotherapy, my doctors came back after the stem cell transplant and said, Greg, we want to put you back onto the same treatment. And I said, guys, this doesn't make logical sense to me. And I asked them, I said, if I achieve remission in October of 2021, I went through a stem cell transplant in February of 2022. We ran additional tests and biopsies and tests to ensure that I was MRD negative, not only before, but also after my stem cell transplant. How is it that I need to go back on the same aggressive treatment that I was on when I had the disease? Sure. And so my doctor said, well, Greg, you know, we want to make sure considering you're high risk, but I said, if we're going to sustain and we're going to monitor myself every single month, wouldn't it be more appropriate to have a lesser medication maintenance than to have to do something extremely aggressive because what I wanted to do was get back to some normalcy in my life. And if I was on six to eight hours of chemo and immunotherapy five days a week, there would be no way for me to be able to work or literally function. And so out of my eight doctors, I got seven of them to agree through committee. Wow. <laughs> and, and basically we ended up starting my treatment out at, at basically two times uh, per month. Okay. And we continue to monitor, we continue to do blood work. Now, as far as my at-home care medication, it's very simple. I'm on a lot of supplements because I chose not to take one drug as an over-the-counter drug because of the toxicity nature of that drug and knowing that it would reduce my white blood cell count based on the research and studies that are out there that my wife and I uh, reviewed. We told our doctors, we said, I'll stay on the single line of IV treatment that I was on when I started. We're continuing that treatment now, just so that I wouldn't have to go on that over-the-counter cancer medication that uh, I was a little bit leery about. Okay. Well, talk about advocating for yourself. Thank you for sharing that with us. So let's talk about life today. What are you up to? What are you doing? What lifestyle adjustments have you made most recently to what appears to me to be a full recovery and living your best life, Gregory? Let's hear it. Well, as I mentioned earlier, when we first started this uh, conversation, my life was very busy, you know, being an entrepreneur and, and had a lot of great things going on. And most of that went on the shelf, uh -huh. which was very sad for me to see a lot of that effort and work go on to the shelf. and. What I had to realize for me is that coming out of this experience, I am not necessarily the person that I was, but now I'm the person that I aspire to be. And so a lot of what transpired with me during my cancer diagnosis was a transformation into really understanding my purpose in life, 
and how much I value my energy and my knowledge and wherewithal to be able to help others Mm -hmm. and be able to provide them with inspiration, to be able to provide them with hope. And so I really poured into a lot of that, as you very well know, and I spent a copious amount of time working for a lot of different foundations and pharmaceutical companies, sharing my story and bringing forth the awareness and inspiration to be able to kind of lift up others and help them know that they're not in this alone. There is a light at the end of the tunnel. And as you mentioned earlier, I have a book coming out. <laughs> uh-huh. Drum roll. <laughs> so I have aspired to become an author based on a lot of the family and friends and, and other followership that's out there that really kind of preempted me to write a book, which was something that I, I really had never really thought about. One of the things that I always like to share with people is for me, putting my vulnerability, exposing everything that was going on with me throughout my cancer journey on social media, it was like therapy for me Mm. because I needed that emotional outlet to get these feelings out of me and just allow for those words to transcend into others' lives and hopefully provide them with, like I said, an understanding that they're not in this circumstance alone. And so- Besides becoming now soon to be a published author, which the book is due to come out, which is entitled Faith, Strength, and Courage, we're getting very good reviews on the book thus far. I am also back to doing a little bit of consultancy work and uh, spending quite a bit of time working on various projects as I was doing before my cancer journey. I haven't recorded a podcast episode in so long, and I'm really, (laughs) you know, I'm kind of itching to get back to doing my own podcast, which is called cut to the chase, which was thriving uh, long before my cancer journey. And certainly uh, those are just some of the things that I'm working on right now, as well as trying to formalize my career into public speaking. Oh, Gregory, this is awesome. And we will include information about the book and podcast in our show notes so that folks can find you and listen in and read your book. I can't wait to read your book. I'm really excited about it. (laughs) So as we start to wrap things up, I'm going to give you the chance to talk about anything else you want to talk about. I love to ask people, what are your best tips for the toughest days? You know, what gets you through when you just have a day that just doesn't feel great? What do you suggest? I think first and foremost, One of the things that I always like to share with people, which is something that for those that have followed me on social media, is don't ever give up. The notion of thinking about giving up starts with your mind. It starts with the acceptance. It starts with your ability to say, okay, yep, this is a bad day, but tomorrow is going to be something different. So you have to have the mental fortitude up front to be able to weather the storm. For me, that is step number one. And of course, as I talk about in my book, you've got to have some type of standardization in your life that provides you with a sense of peace and a sense of joy. And for me, it was my faith. And during this journey, what people will quickly realize is that Despite my busy, busy entrepreneurial career when I first was diagnosed, I had gotten away from my faith. And throughout this process, rekindling that faith and finding that spirituality that was needed to kind of give me that peace and joy and console me in a way that I knew that the world was not consoling me at the time. And I think the last two components, which are entitled in my book, is having the courage to understand that you can persevere, you can weather the storm, and you can overcome any particular fear that is out there. And the strength. The strength doesn't necessarily come from the physicality. It also is mental. Because in a lot of cases, as you heard me say earlier, you're going to have conflicting information, you know, from your doctors. You're going to have things that are not going to go right. All of these things are going to test your mental strength. They're going to test your physical strength because you're being told no. And so therefore, you have to have the strength to advocate for yourself, the strength to educate yourself, the strength to know that this is your life we're talking about. Mm -hmm. 
And when it comes to my life, there is no amount of money, there is no decisions that can be made without ensuring that I am a part of that holistically. And so I always try to ensure when I'm speaking with individuals and helping them understand what's in front of them, or should I say what lies ahead on this journey, is, like I said, education. You know, you can't take your circumstance for granted and allow for someone else to make those decisions that are very essential in not only your quality of life, but your care. And the last point that I would like to make here is that you're not in this alone. Mm -hmm. There's so many groups, foundations, Facebook groups. I mean, there's a wealth of information out there, and it's always best to go seek out that help that you need, whether it's emotional, uh, financial, or someone that has the same characteristics of your disease to be able to learn from them and get those insights and tips that can help you be more successful in your journey. Well, amen to that, Gregory. That is just so wonderful. And thank you so much for sharing your heart and your soul. I do want to add that Gregory's wife, Monica, was on one of our recent Lunch and Learns, October 18th. And what a delight talking to her about her experience as Gregory's caregiver. So if you want to tune into that, the recording is available on our website. So Gregory, one more question for you. Was it all worth it? Tell me about that. <laughs> and I know the answer already, but I want to hear you say it. <laughs> Peggy, I will have to say a thousand. Well, it, I, it, it's unquantifiable. It's unmeasurable. Mm. Yes, it is all worth it because any day above ground is better mm. than a day in ground. Uh huh. What people don't realize is when you're dealing with this disease, and in my case, being high risk, I could not walk when I was diagnosed because of the tumor that had protruded through on my upper right hip area. These are things that we don't take for granted when you step back and realize what was your life like before, as opposed to what your life can become as long as you make the right decisions. And so for me, absolutely quantifiably, yes, you know, <laughs> like there, like I said, there's no measurement in, you know, the admiration of saying, was it worth it for me? Because it is worth it. Because for me, I know I have so much more to give to the world, so much more to share with the world. And I'm excited about the new journey that I'm on right now. And for me, I guess the last thing I want to say is thank you for having me on the National Bone Marrow Transplant Link and for this opportunity to be able to share my story and hope to inspire others. Oh, there is no doubt you are going to be inspiring others. And Gregory, thank you so much for your honesty and your sincerity. And I can't wait to read your book. So uh, hint, hint, I hope I get a copy or I will buy a copy, whatever, <laughs> whatever works best. So I look forward to that. Absolutely. Thank you again, my friend. Thank you. This has been the Marrow Masters Podcast. If you know someone who would benefit from the information in our show, please share this episode with them. And don't miss future episodes of our show. Follow Marrow Masters for free on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you're listening right now. And to connect with the National Bone Marrow Transplant Link, visit nbmtlink.org or tap the link in our show notes.